So today we are presenting on ancient Indian Vedic wisdom. Before we start, uh, we first have to pay our uh, humble respects and give honor to our gurus who have made it possible for us to learn about this and have made it possible for our lives to be transformed. So we just give a humble uh, prayer. Om Jana Timirin Hasya Janan Jana Salakaya Chakshur Un Militamya in a Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Panchatat Bamakam Krishnam Bhakti Rupas Rupakam Bhakti Bhataram Bhakti Kyam Namami Bhakti Shakti Kam. I offer my obeisance unto Sri Guru Dev, who has opened my eyes, which were blinded by the darkness of ignorance with the salve of divine knowledge. Again and again I offer my obeisance unto the Supreme Lord's devotees who are saviors of the fallen, oceans of mercy, and wish-fulfilling trees. Acharyavan Purusho Veda. The meaning of the Upanishads can be understood only by those who have their guru. Not everyone can understand the real meaning of the Upanishads, but only those who are at the disposal of the real guru can have access there. By intellectualism, we cannot understand their real meaning. Only by approaching the guru with a serving attitude will the meaning be revealed. He will come and express himself to us, and we are to have the mood, I am unqualified and low, but he will come and give admission irrespective of any intellect, study, or anything else on my part. This is by Srila Bhakti Rakshak, Sridhar Dev Goswami Maharaj, in his book called Centenary Anthology. Um, this is just to highlight the importance of the instruction of the bona fide spiritual master when we are uh, looking to engage in spiritual life. Uh, it's not something that can be done by our own mental effort. It's something that can only be done through cultivating humility, tolerance, giving respect to others, and not expecting it in return. Through cultivating this kind of mood, uh, we're able to be more receptive to what is being offered um, by the true spiritual masters, by the gurus, by the acharyas who are uh, having their life's purpose to be to teach these things to sincere seekers who are looking for more and what material life has given. We find in the Upanishads that they give mere statements with no rhyme or reason, with no explanation or certification attached. This is because such knowledge is meant for higher level, where there is no possibility of any deception. Whatever is said there is taken by the listeners as complete truth. There is no room for doubt, because in a higher civilized plane, there is no possibility of any deception. The Upanishads say, this means so-and-so, and the natural response comes, yes, it is so. There is, there is no tarka, reasoning, and no doubt, or anything of the kind, because the very plane itself is such that deception is unknown. So in the case of the Vedas and Upanishads, we are cautioned. Don't take your reasoning and doubt into that higher stage. It is unnecessary there, where there is only plain speaking and fair dealing with no trouble from anyone wanting to deceive another. Deception and unfair dealings are unknown there. This is the level of the Vedas and Upanishads where rhyme and reason are unnecessary. But in a lower stage, the Smriti and Puranas come to give their advice in another mood. The Puranas are like friends advising, do this and you will be benefited. They give examples. This person acted in such a way and received a good result. But this other did bad things and a bad result followed. So my friend, please learn from this. Then the Smriti comes to our help by showing us how to apply these truths in our everyday life. So as we're about to see, um, the Vedic knowledge is uh, has come to us in our modern age in the form of these uh, books, ancient scriptures from India, ancient India. And uh, there's many different types of books within the Vedic knowledge. 
and they all have different purposes. And this is uh, elucidating a little bit what those purposes are. Uh, some of the purposes are beyond trying to help the most fallen gradually come up to a higher realization. They're just very mercifully giving that highest realization irrespective of the realization of the individual souls. And then there are other literatures which are not uh, very outwardly giving the highest realization, but they're more for helping the fallen souls gradually progress to the higher realization. And this was given, this quote here is from uh, Srila Sridhar Maharaj again. So uh, we have here just a small glossary for some of the words that we used. Um, this has a reference. The word shruti means that which is heard or known by revelation, such as the four Vedas. Smriti is that which is remembered, that which is authored uh, like the book of civil or religious law, such as Manu Smriti or Manu Samhita. Shrimad Bhagavatam is one of the 18 Puranas, a holy scripture exclusively on the subject of Lord Krishna, uh, written by Srila Vyasadeva, who is also the author of Vedanta Sutra. The Upanishads are the conclusions of the Vedas, giving knowledge of the Supreme Spirit. Vedanta Sutra, also known as Brahma Sutra, are the aphorisms of Vedanta philosophy, uh, written by Vyasadev. Vedanta is the conclusion of the Vedas, and Veda means knowledge, and is uh, the, the main four Vedas known as Rig Veda, Yajur Veda, Sama Veda, and Atharva Veda. And then we have some more, a uh, little deeper and complementary uh, explanations on the right side. So, This is from the Brahma Samhita, which is known as a Shruti. This was uh, given by Lord Brahma, who uh, is the creator of the material universe. And this will explain a little bit about Lord Brahma's position. The lotus that appears from the navel of Vishnu is linked in the relativity of all souls. Four-headed Brahma, the knower of the four Vedas, takes his birth within that lotus. Thereafter, the Gayatri of threefold form, that is, of the form of Omkara, or the syllable Om, emanated as the beautiful harmonious sequence of the song of Sri Krishna's flute. Entering the ears of Brahma, it was swiftly manifest within his lotus mouth. Thus Brahma, who was born of the lotus flower, received Gayatri as it emanated from the divine flute song of Sri Krishna. And so he was initiated by the Supreme Lord, the original guru, and elevated to the status of twice born. Becoming enlightened by meditating upon that threefold Gayatri, Brahma became acquainted with the ocean of truth. Then he worshiped Sri Krishna singing his transcendental glories by this hymn, which is the quintessence of all the Vedas. So this presentation is about Vedic wisdom. Vedic uh, means coming from the four Vedas. But the four Vedas uh, are talking about the nature of reality. And the source of the Vedas is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And as we go in through the presentation, we'll explain, uh, you know, why is that significant? But the idea here is that uh, the Vedas are coming directly from God, being given to his own disciple. Uh, again, as we started off in this presentation, giving honor and respect to Guru, uh, the reason we do that is because the only way that we can come to the truth is by this process of surrender to Guru. And a bona fide Guru is surrendered to another Guru and so on and so forth. And that initial Guru, the original Guru is God. And that's the whole foundation of the Vedic process, is that this knowledge about reality, how to live, how to operate, what is truth, what is true reality, how do we get out of material entanglement, all of this knowledge is being given from God, passed down through this disciplic succession and arriving to us in this modern day. So 
uh, from God in the form of Vishnu, which is actually uh, an avatar or an expansion of Krishna. Uh, from God, it is coming to Lord Brahma, the creator of the material universe. From Lord Brahma, he's passing to his disciple named Narada Muni. From Narada Muni, he's passing to his disciple, Veda Vyas. And from Veda Vyas, he's passing to his disciple, Madhvacharya. So Veda Vyas, this whole time, that whole uh, disciplic succession that we just named, it was all uh, shruti, it means it was passed through sound only, through word. But it wasn't written down at all. And then when it came to Veda Vyas, uh, he was manifest here in this world about 5,000 years ago uh, within Kali Yuga, which is our current age, which is um, an age when people are very much angry, very much. Uh, having animosity, fighting with each other. Uh, the lifespan is less, their memories are less. Overall intelligence about reality and the relationship with God is almost gone. Atheism is primary throughout the world. That, that is uh, the nature of this current age. So for the Vedic knowledge to be able to still help individuals who are seeking more than material life, Veda Vyas took all that knowledge and wisdom that was passed down through only sound and wrote it down. That's why he's called Veda Vyas. He wrote the Vedas. So uh, there are six Vedic darshans uh, and they, they gradually develop in conception. First is the Nyaya, the philosophy of logic and reasoning, then Visheshika, the Vedic atomic theory, and Sankhya, non-theistic dualism or analysis of matter and spirit. Then yoga, self-discipline for self-realization. Then karma mimamsa, elevation through the performance of duty, the science of fruit of work. And finally, Vedanta, the conclusion of the Vedic revelation, the science of God realization. So beginning with Nyaya, each of the Sad Darshans in their own turn presents a more developed and comprehensive explanation of the aspects of Vedic knowledge. So now starting with Vedanta, that last school, which is the most developed, where the conclusion of all the Vedic knowledge is in Vedanta. Vedanta means Veda, knowledge, and Anta means the end. So the end of knowledge, the conclusion of knowledge, the conclusion of the Vedas. And that uh, is written in the Vedanta Sutra by Veda Vyas, who we were just talking about, who uh, is the uh, personality who took all those, all that knowledge, all the Vedic knowledge and wrote the four Vedas, put it into those books. He also wrote Vedanta Sutra, which is the conclusion of the Vedas. So there have been various um, other personalities who have written commentaries on the Vedanta Sutra each with a different angle of vision of what uh, Vedanta means. So one is Advaita, is non-dual or monism. That uh, was given by Shankaracharya. His commentary on Vedanta Sutra is known as Sariraka Basya. It's actually an atheistic commentary. Then we have Vishishta Advaita, qualified monism, given by Ramanujacharya. His commentary on the Vedanta Sutra is known as Sri Basya, theistic commentary. And we have Shuddhadvaita, purely non-dual, given by Vishnu Swami. His commentary on Vedanta Sutra is known as Sarvagya Basya, also theistic. Then we have Dvaita, dualism, given by Madhvacharya. His commentary is called the Porna Pragya Basya, again, is theistic. Beta beta is the difference and non-difference, but a comparative recognition of both difference and non-difference. Uh, it was given by Nimbarkacharya. And actually, uh, beta beta and this dvaita dvaita are uh, essentially the same concept, essentially. Um, and his, so Nimbarkacharya's commentary on Vedanta Sutra was the Parijata Sarabhabhasya. And then we have the Achintya Beta Beta, 
which means inconceivable and simultaneous difference and non-difference. So it's not just a comparative recognition that difference and non-difference exist, but that simultaneously right, the living entities are both simultaneously different and non-different from God. And this principle of inconceivableness is applied uh, through, through reality. Uh, much of our experience is contradictory has this uh, capacity to be a paradox. And this Achinta Beta Beta philosophy gives a very lucid uh, way for us to understand why our experience is so paradoxical at times and uh, what that means about the, re the nature of reality and how to operate within that reality. What is the proper way to operate within that paradoxical nature? So this philosophy was given by Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Uh, within this line of thought, the commentary on Vedanta Sutra is known as the Govinda Basya, which was written by Sri Baladeva Vidya Bhushan. And also within this line of thought is the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the natural commentary on the Vedanta Sutra. Just like the others that were named here, it's a commentary on Vedanta Sutra, but the, the huge distinguishing factor is that the Srimad Bhagavatam was a commentary written by the same author of Vedanta Sutra, by Veda Vyas. So at the end of his manifest pastimes in the material world, Veda Vyas and his philosophical and intellectual maturity uh, reflected on his life, reflected on everything that he had written in Vedanta Sutra and all the other Vedic knowledge. And he wrote the essence of all of that in Srimad Bhagavatam. So then we're going to continue now uh, from this point of view of Srimad Bhagavatam and uh, continuing from the point of this Achintya Beta Abeda Tattva, embracing this inconceivable simultaneous difference and non difference. The conception of God and the conception of the absolute truth are not on the same level. The Srimad Bhagavatam hits on the target of the absolute truth. The conception of God indicates the controller, whereas the conception of the absolute truth indicates the summum bonum or the ultimate source of all energies. There is no difference of opinion about the personal feature of God as the controller because the controller cannot be impersonal. Of course, modern government, especially democratic government, is impersonal to some extent, but ultimately the chief executive head is a person, and the impersonal feature of the government is subordinate to the personal feature. So without a doubt, whenever we refer to control over others, we must admit the existence of a personal feature. Because there are different controllers for different managerial positions, there may be many small gods, According to the Bhagavad Gita, any controller who has some specific extraordinary power is called a vibhutimat sattva, or controller empowered by the Lord. There are many vibhutimat sattvas, controllers or gods with various uh, specific powers, but the absolute truth is one without a second. This Srimad Bhagavatam designates the absolute truth or the summum bonum as a param satyam. So, this is the introduction to Srimad Bhagavatam given by um, the modern uh, devotee in our modern times, Srila Esi Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, who actually brought this whole conception of Vedic wisdom to the West. Uh, he came from India to the United States in the 1960s. And uh, within 10 years, he was able to spread and give this conception to the entire world, quite literally. Um, so, the, so one thing to, to notice about what's being said here is that there is a, a supreme Godhead uh, and then these smaller gods. So this is a very, um, this, this harmonious conception of reality that can kind of fit pieces of different worldviews together, right? We know in Greek, mythology, uh, you know, we have Zeus, we have 
Poseidon. We have all these gods, right, that are elemental. They have some elemental capacity. But there's no real talk of like a supreme god. It's just like all these gods that fight with each other. And that is also found in other traditions. Um, so what the Vedic conception is, is saying is that just like the Abrahamic faith starts saying, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, there is one supreme God. There is one supreme absolute being. And then there are, uh, so the supreme God is infinite, is unlimited. And then there are gradations of different kinds of um, finite beings. We are finite beings, we're human beings. But uh, above us, still finite, but having some more power over the environment, are these empowered beings called demigods, who have the capacity to control uh, the weather, to control uh, various elemental aspects of our environment. In the Vedic conception, everything is personal. Everything has personality behind it. Everything has intelligence behind it. To some people, that seems like a little bit of a fairy tale, but actually, uh, this kind of thinking was also held by Aristotle. You know, when he saw the stars and the planets moving in such specific patterns for such a long period of time, with such a high probability of like collision and and all this destruction, but yet it didn't really happen so much. The the stars and the planets were rotating and orbiting at the same pace the same pattern. And that was all, uh, for him, that was all a sign of intelligence, that that kind of behavior of the stars and planets could only be because there was some intelligence organizing that pattern. A pattern is, is uh, representative that there is some intelligence, some organizing capacity there. And that's only coming from intelligent beings, right? We only find intelligence in a personal being. So in the same way, uh, the ancient people in, in Veda and also the ancient Greeks, uh, they saw that there's personality behind even the elemental features of our environment, but they are below and they are beneath the supreme controller. So this kind of harmonizes what we find in the Abrahamic faiths as the supreme God, and also what we find in ancient Greek mythology and other um, you know, pantheistic, pantheism uh, religions where they say there's so many different gods of all these different elements. So, <clears throat> now we have the first verse of Bhagavatam here. This was written by Veda Vyas, who is also the author of Adanta Sutra. Oh, my Lord, Sri Krishna, son of Vasudev, O oh, all pervading personality of Godhead. I offer my respectful obeisances unto you. I meditate upon Lord Sri Krishna because he is the absolute truth and the primeval cause of all causes of the creation, sustenance and destruction of the manifested universes. He is directly and indirectly conscious of all manifestations and he is independent because there is no other cause beyond him. It is he only who first imparted the Vedic knowledge unto the heart of Brahmaji, the original living being. By him, even the great sages and demigods are placed into illusion. As one is bewildered by the illusory representations of water seen in fire or land seen on water, only because of him do the material universes tempor temporarily manifested by the reactions of the three modes of nature appear factual, although they are unreal. I therefore meditate upon him, Lord Sri Krishna, who is eternally existent in the transcendental abode, which is forever free from the illusory representations of the material world. I meditate upon him, for he is the absolute truth. So now we also find this conception of the absolute truth uh, in the West, in the philosophy of G.W. of Hegel, a German philosopher. So Sarvad dharmam pritjaga mamekam sharanam braja. Srimad Bhagavad Gita, chapter 18, verse 66. Krishna explains his position. Abandon all dharmas or duties and just surrender unto me. Now I want to represent this conception from another standpoint. Hegel was a good German philosopher and in his philosophy, he has given a concept. 
The absolute truth, the prime cause of everything, must have two qualifications. What are they? It must be by itself and for itself. Please try to pay attention. By itself means that he is his own cause. Nothing else created him. If anything has created him, that creator will have the primary importance. Therefore, to be the absolute, he must be anadi, eternal, existing, and not created by anything. The absolute must have this qualification. The next qualification is that the absolute truth is for itself. He exists for his own satisfaction, not to satisfy any other. If his existence was for the purpose of satisfying any other entity, that would make him secondary and he would not hold the prime position. Therefore, the absolute must have these two qualifications. He is his own cause and he exists only to satisfy himself, to fulfill his own purpose. The absolute is by itself and for itself. Even uh, If even a blade of grass moves, it is to fulfill the purpose of the absolute. This is from Srila Bhakti Rachachar, Dev Goswami Maharaj again. So these are some uh, verses from various Vedic scriptures emphasizing the same point that the absolute is by itself and for itself. This is from uh, Brahma Samhita. Ishvaraha Paramaha Krishnaha Satchirananda Vigraha Anadir Adir Govindaha Sarva Karana Karanam. Krishna, who is known as Govinda, is the Supreme Godhead. He has an eternal, blissful spiritual body. He is the origin of all. He has no other origin. And he is the prime cause of all causes. So, this conception, as we just read uh, before, is found in Hegel's philosophy found in the Vedic philosophy, that the absolute is the cause of itself. It's also found in Spinoza. Spinoza is a Western philosopher. Spinoza called this causa sui, that uh, the supreme, the absolute, has to be the cause of itself. Otherwise, whatever caused the supreme would actually be more supreme. So in order for the concept of the absolute to exist, it has to rely on nothing but itself for its own being. And this is, again, found not only in Vedic uh, wisdom of the East, but this is found in Hegel and Spinoza of Western tradition also. So uh, this is something that these very intelligent, highly realized and pious souls realized based on, you know, whatever capacity they had by the grace of God. This is the, uh, yeah, this is the invocation of Sri Isha Upanishad. Om Purnam Adha Purnam Idam Purna Purnam Udachite Purnasya Purnam Adaya Purnam Eva Vasishate. The personality of Godhead is perfect and complete. And because he is completely perfect, all emanations from him, such as this phenomenal world, are perfectly equipped as complete wholes. Whatever is produced of the complete whole is also complete in itself. Because he is the complete whole, even though so many complete human units emanate from him, he remains the complete balance. So this is articulating uh, the idea of organic holism, that the entire, the entire reality uh, that we are participating in right now, the material aspect, and the full spiritual reality. That is all God. And, and um, all the living entities that are within the reality, that are having their own individual experiences, for better or worse, they are wholes, right? We, we experience ourselves. We are, we are a part of this. This isn't just some kind of abstract thought. This is what we're participating in. So we can experience that we are a, a whole to some extent. Right, we we have to. Uh, right, we are complete in ourselves, um, and so we're coming from another whole, God, and the fact that whole is coming from the whole, it doesn't mean that that initial whole is losing anything. The example is sometimes given of a candle, right? You have, let's say, you start with one candle, 
and then you have 50 other candles that you're going to light from that original candle. You can light as many candles as you want from that original flame, and that original flame is not going to dwindle at all, right? So this is a similar idea. Uh, the infinite, infinite number of souls coming from God, but that does not take away from his infinite capacity at all. And with, within that infinite capacity, God is not only uh, him, not just a masculine, his, the feminine aspect is there. It's Sri Radha Krishna. Radha Rani is the feminine aspect of God and Krishna is the male aspect. So the avatars or incarnations of the Supreme Personality of God and appearance of the infinite in the finite world. So we have uh, two definitions given here from our gurus. An avatar, one who crosses down a form or role assumed by the Lord or one of his devotees when they descend from the spiritual world to the material world. In general, the Lord has six types of avatars. Purusha avatars who maintain the creation, Leela avatars who perform special pastimes, Guna avatars who regulate the modes of material nature, Manvantara avatars, the fathers of mankind, Yuga avatars who establish the Dharma for each age, and Shakti Avesha avatars, souls who are empowered to perform particular functions. Avatari, is the origin of all avatars, the Supreme Lord's original form as Sri Krishna in the mood of Madhurya and Sri Gaurasundar in the mood of, Ar of Odarya. So in this last definition, it says Sri Krishna in the mood of Madhurya. Uh, before we said that the absolute is by itself and for itself. So it's the source of itself and it's for its own purposes. Everything is serving the will of God and because God is personal, the will of God is a particular kind of will. It's infinite, just like the rest of God. It's infinite and inconceivable to us. But the will of God is there. And what here it means by Krishna in the mood of Madhurya. It, Madhurya means, uh, we can say Madhurya means relishing. Everything is happening for that enjoyment of the Supreme. And then Gora Sundar, uh, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is an avatar also of the Lord. And he's in the mood of Odarya, it means distributing. So we have two functions here, Madhurya relishing and Odarya uh, distributing. So the idea here is God is most happy and enjoying when the souls, the individual souls, recognize their constitutional position as part and parcel of God and are engaging in loving devotional service. And by engaging in that constitutional activity, then they are also relishing the transcendental quality of Satchitananda, eternity, knowledge, and bliss. So by the mercy of God, he comes in these avatars to, uh, to distribute what is the purpose of life? What is the identity of the individual soul? How you can get from where you are to this higher level of existence and relish that mood of service and the Satchitananda, the eternity, knowledge, and bliss that comes with that plane of service, transcendental service. In the Bhagavad Gita, the personality of Godhead, Sri Krishna has expressly given a description of his transcendental appearance, disappearance, and activities. The Lord appears in a particular family or place by his inconceivable potency. He does not take his birth as a conditioned soul, quits his body, and accepts another. His birth is like the appearance and disappearance of the sun. The sun arises on the eastern horizon, but that does not mean that the eastern horizon is the parent of the sun. The sun exists in every part of the solar system, but he becomes visible at a scheduled time and so also becomes invisible at another scheduled time. Similarly, the Lord appears in this universe like the sun and again leaves our sight at another time. He exists at all times and at every place, 
but by his causeless mercy, when he appears before us, we take it for granted that he has taken his birth. Anyone who can understand this truth in terms of the statements of the revealed scriptures certainly becomes liberated just after quitting the present body. So this is given by Srila A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada in his purport, his commentary on verse 26 in chapter 10 of the first canto of Bhagavatam. So this is making the very nice analogy that, you know, we understand that the sun exists even when we don't have light. At night, when we only have the illumination of the moon, we know the sun is still there. But the sun rises on the eastern horizon and illuminates the sky for us and then sets on the west. But that doesn't mean when we can't see it anymore, then it doesn't still have existence and is serving purpose in other places. So in a similar way, just because God might not be manifest in front of us as an avatar right now, that does not mean that somewhere in the universe, he is not manifest serving that purpose. So here we're also saying Desha Kala Patra, place, time, and circumstances must be considered in relation to the form and function of an avatar, the content of revealed scriptures, and the capacity of the general public to understand. So before we were saying everything is happening for, uh, by, by the will of the Lord. So the circumstances in any given time or place are also serving the purpose of the Lord. Now, the, the human, the, not the humans, but the living entities who take the form of humans, animals, plants, everything that's alive, they have their free will to either uh, cultivate a relationship with God or reject it and cultivate, you know, a more self-centered and sense-satisfying existence. And their capacity to understand, like we were saying before, is much less in this current age that we're in, this age of Kali. And that is because the souls that are here right now, in the majority, they actually have the inherent desire to be in ignorance, to enjoy themselves, and to just be completely immersed and engulfed in that kind of uh, enjoyment. Some people actually relish, like you were saying before, the mood of anger. Some people actually relish those kind of things. They might not outright say it. Sometimes they even might say it, but they actually relish these kind of things. And the uh, the negative reaction that comes isn't such a concern to them. They're so engulfed in the ignorance of uh, relishing self-centered negative things that the reaction isn't a concern, but the reaction still comes, of course, but it's not of their uh, consideration. So out of the mercy of the Lord, he gives us that freedom to enjoy if we want to enjoy in that way although it makes no sense to some people they would say it makes no sense to want to live like that but to some people that's how they want to live and you know they have the freedom to do that and and <laughs> that's a party part of the lord's mercy they have the mercy and they have the capacity to live as they want so in that way even when bad things are happening it's still going on by the will of the lord by allowing the kids to make the mistake so to speak you know learn from their own mistakes because when that freedom is used to develop love of god that makes the personal relationship so much sweeter when that free will is actually used to not try to serve our own sense pleasure our own uh, gratification but to try to dedicate our entire capacity to learning and serving the supreme and it makes that relationship so much sweeter so that's the, the point of it and then as we know, there's so many different religions in the world, so many different kinds of scriptures that sometimes are saying contradictory things. You know, sometimes the Bible and the Quran and Veda will say contradictory things among each other. And even within themselves, the Bible will say contradictory things within itself. The Quran will say contradictory thing within itself. Veda will say contradictory thing within itself. So how do we make sense of that, right? We were talking about the parad paradoxical nature of reality before. It's because of this desha kalapatra, place, time, and circumstances. When, when a parent is raising a kid, 
they say, be careful of strangers. Don't approach strangers. That's bad. But when you get older, you know, you can't live unless you're going to approach strangers and, you know, you have to be able to, to live in the world around you and cooperate with your fellow human beings. But when you're a kid, they say, don't do that. That's bad. But then you're older and you're mature. Now it's a good thing. So the same action, uh, the same action has a different value based on maturity. So in some of the revealed scriptures, it's saying, don't do something. Because the people in the place and time where that scripture is being revealed, that's their level of maturity. And that's what they have to be told to gradually develop in spiritual life. And another time and place, they'll be at a little different development, for better or worse. So the revealed scripture will be a little different based on where they are. So that's uh, the idea there. So karma and reincarnation. Karma simply means material actions always produce reactions, extremely similar to Newton's third law. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. Our self-centered exploitive actions, which seek various kinds of sense enjoyment, will always produce some fruitive result. If our exploitive actions are good, we will come back to this material world next lifetime in order to be rewarded. If our exploitive actions are bad, we will come to be punished. This cycle of birth and death, reincarnation, fueled by self-centered fruit of desires, is known as samsara. Bahunam janmanam ante janhavan mam prapadyante vasudeva sarvam miti samahatma sadorlabha. This is Bhagavad Gita, chapter 7, verse 19. After many births, the enlightened soul, blessed with devotional association, realizes that everything is of the nature of Vasudev, subordinate to Vasudev, God. And thus he surrenders unto me. Such a great soul is very rare. Beyond sense enjoyment. But in the case of a pure devotee, the senses are not all artificially stopped from doing anything, but they are given different good engagements. When the senses are engaged in more attractive activities, there is no chance of their being attracted by any inferior engagements. In the Bhagavad Gita, it is said that the senses can be controlled only by better engagements. Devotional service necessitates purifying the senses or engaging them in activities of devotional service. Devotional service is not in action. Anything done in the service of the Lord becomes at once purified of its material nature. The material conception is due to ignorance only. There's nothing beyond Vasudev. So one of the practices of Bhakti Yoga, uh, one of the practices recommended in the Vedas for spiritual development is called honoring prashadam. So normally in the material world, you know, we have to upkeep our body. So we're drinking things and we're eating things. And then those things that we're eating and the things that we're drinking have some taste. We have the sense or the sense of taste or and smell. They smell good. So now we're not just consuming those things to keep our body, you know, working, but because they make us feel good. They just we like to eat tasty things. We like to drink tasty things. Sometimes there is like a societal attribute there. Oh, this is fancy. Now I want to eat something fancy. Then it starts to become like gorging. Now I'm just, I can't even control it. I'm eating, drinking so much. Some of these things, so it's becoming intoxicating. Not even, you know, not even with alcohol yet, but just intoxicating the this activity of eating and feeling good about what I'm eating. And then even more intoxicating, and now they're having some psychoactive effects. So there, there's all these layers of enjoyment that actually drag us deeper into ignorance, into this self-centered consciousness where we're just living to enjoy the world around us without knowing what we're actually trying to do. But this process of bhakti yoga is not, and I repeat, not about renunciation, about giving all that up. It's about learning how to do it properly, actually. <laughs> like 
when when we offer the food to God and we prepare it in a mentality of this is going to be an offering, you know, actually we want to make it as tasty as possible. We want to make it as nice as possible. And then we're going to offer it to God. It's an opportunity to remember the Lord. And then we're taking that prashadam as uh, the Lord's remnants. We're honoring that. And uh, it's helping with our spiritual purification. And all the maintenance of our body and all the tastiness and all that's, that is there, that is being taken care of. But that's not, the, that's not the focus. The focus is we're trying to develop this mentality, this life, these spiritual principles of serving God in, in various ways. And one of them is honoring prashadam. And actually, it's from personal experience, I can say it's much better than just gorging without knowing what's going on. <laughs> Of course, with uh, prashadam, you know, it's not just anything that can be offered to God. The Vedas recommend particularly uh, vegetarian items, no meat, fish, or eggs, and no onion or garlic. Uh, but again, from experience, I can say that it's not as limiting as it sounds at all. When that's all you eat, you think, what am I going to do? I'm going to starve. But that is not the case at all. And... Uh, is very nice, actually. So, we must enter into that harmonious dance. In Hegelian language, this is called self-determination. Self-determination means we must die to live. We must leave our material life and all our material habits. We have to die as we are if we want to have a real life. We must give up our false ego. Our material habits from different births are all collected in the ego in subtle forms, not only from the experience of human birth, but even from animal births, tree births, and so many other births. Krishna consciousness means the wholesale dissolution of the false ego. That concocted selfish figure within us is our enemy. The real self is hopelessly buried beneath the false ego. So great is the depth of our forgetfulness that we do not even know who we are. So as the German philosopher Hegel said, we have to die to live. Reality is for itself and by itself. The world is not created for our selfish end. It has a universal end. And we are part and parcel of that. We must come to an understanding with the whole. The complete whole is Krishna. And he is dancing, playing, and singing in his own way. We must enter into that harmonious dance. Said by Srila Bhakti Rachak, Sridhar Maharaj. So now these are the last few concluding slides. The unified conception of true reality. Um, maybe you've been able to notice that so far, uh, Vedic wisdom is actually a unified conception of ontology, theology, and epistemology. Right? Ontology is the study of being. Theology is the study of God, and epistemology is the study of knowledge. And normally, these things are kind of uh, broken apart and, and studied in isolation from each other, as if they exist independent from each other. But that's, that's not the case. Uh, these things are integrated in our experienced reality. These are all aspects of, uh, these are all ways to study is a reality that is integrated, that is connected, not isolated. And this Vedic conception, this Vedic wisdom uh, is delivering knowledge that is in that holistic form. So these approaches to studying reality are integrated within Vedic wisdom as a unified conception of the true living conscious and dynamic reality the material world and transcendental reality, planes of conscious experience, exploitation, renunciation, and dedication. Exploitation means material reality. We're trying to enjoy everything for ourselves. Renunciation means that we see the downfall of exploitation, so we don't want to act at all, but still that's in self-interest. We're still just worried about ourselves trying to get a better result. And then finally, we have dedication where we're not thinking for our own benefit at all. We don't want to enjoy for ourselves, and we don't want to give it all up so we can enjoy in a different way. 
We want to just use everything, all of our capacities uh, in the service of God. So transcendent reality is our natural home, but due to degraded and perverted consciousness, self-centered karmic reaction, we experience reality as the material world, the plan of exploitation, assumed predominance of matter, survival of the fittest. The aim of applied Vedic wisdom is to guide us back home to the transcendental plane of dedication to the organic whole reality, where all participants are serving the center for the benefit of all. So the idea here is that the organic whole, the center of reality and the whole of reality is, is the supreme and that all of the participating living beings uh, are, are naturally most fulfilled and taken care of when they're serving the whole. And in the Vedic wisdom, uh, they give two examples. Watering the roots of a tree is one. If we want to take care of a tree, we're not going watering the leaf, watering the flower, watering the branch, watering the fruit, right? That's actually not effective at all. If we want the whole tree, all the fruit, all the leaves, all the branches, everything to flourish, we have to water the roots and only the roots. So there is a central point where we have to direct our energy. And through directing our energy to that central point, then the entire thing, the whole is taken care of. In the same way, if we want our body to survive, we're not shoving food under our fingernails or up our nose in our ears, right? That's not how it works. We have to put the food in our mouth, digest it. And then the ears, the nose, the fingers, everything is taken care of. We have to serve the center. So these are uh, ways that that idea is demonstrated. You serve the center of realities. Learn how to serve God lovingly. Learn what that actually means. And then that is how the totality of reality, the organic whole, will flourish. So finally, idols of the mind versus true reality. Descartes cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, has come to signify the slogan for modern modernity. I think puts all the important power of the thinking the I, not only that it also establishes the absolute being of the I. However, if we try to determine how it is that we perform this amazing activity of thinking, we draw a blank. If I don't know how to do it, then the certainty that I do it should at least seem dubitable. Hegel looks at the problem more realistically. Withdrawn from reality to be with one's subjective thought alone is a detachment from the substantial content of true reality and becomes a conceit or superiority to it. This type of freedom from the content must be given up. And instead of arbitrarily directing the content of one's thought, one's freedom should be sunk into and pervade the content of reality, letting thought be directed and controlled by reality's own proper nature of which our essential selves are but a part and manifestation. We do not lose anything thereby except our false sense of self, the false ego, and rather gain our true identity in real concrete freedom. This is from Shripad Bhakti Madhava Puri Maharaj, the serving director of the Princeton Bhaktivedanta Institute in his book, Idols of the Mind versus True Reality. So again, this is the saying that the focus is on the I, but the very foundation of the concept of I is a thought. It's not, I is not matter, I is a concept. And if we can uh, if we can dive deeper into what is actually going on, what is the process behind being even self-centered? What is the actual process of that? That it's all a subjective thing? Then that will open us up to uh, more of the true nature of reality, that the, uh, reality is not filled with isolated objects uh, of which we are one. We are not an isolated object in reality, right? We are having a subjective experience in a reality that is integrated. It's an integrated whole, an organic whole. So this uh, is the idea of Vedic knowledge. I hope by the grace of uh, our spiritual masters that I could try to communicate something effectively. Uh, next time in the next meeting, we're gonna go over uh, Vedic knowledge, uh, Vedic wisdom and consciousness studies. 
how, how applied Vedic wisdom helps uh, modern consciousness studies efforts. So again, I just want to uh, conclude by giving honor to our gurus. I offer my obeisance unto Sri Guru Dev, who has opened my eyes, which were blinded by the darkness of ignorance with the salve of divine knowledge. Again and again, I offer my obeisances unto the Supreme Lord's devotees, who are servitors of the fallen oceans of mercy and wish fulfilling trees. So I guess it's a little late now. It's almost 5.30. Do you have to go or do you have any questions or anything? No. Um, I, I mean, we could chat for a little longer if you'd like. Um, I... Uh, was interested, we're going to be putting this up, right, on the YouTube. Yes. I was interested in looking at the, um, one of the books that was on one of the slides, checking that out online. I think it was the, well, it was the Vedanta. Bhagavatam? Oh, uh, yeah. The, uh, what is that? The, it's called uh, Srimad Bhagavatam. Bhagavatam. No, uh, the the four Vedas. Those are. Uh, now what it is? The four Vedas are like very big, very very big books. Oh, are they? Okay. <laughs> I would, uh, if you is want. That's too uh, dense. <laughs> yeah, I would recommend like you know, starting with Bhagavad Gita. That's a good okay. place to start for sure. Yeah, there's one translation which is real nice called. Uh, it's called the. Uh, this one. This sweet play of the uh, the play of the sweet absolute by Bhakti Rakshak Sridhar Maharaj by Sridhar Maharaj. I can put a link to it actually. It's free online. Okay. I also um, I got this one. Um, it's by Swami Prabhava uh, Prabhavananda. Swami Prabhavananda. I haven't heard of him. Um, what what has it said so far? Well, it um, actually reminded me of uh, the preface on uh, in um, Idols of the Mind versus True Reality. It was uh, it went on. I'm, I'm only on the introduction and the. Um, before the Gita and Mahabharata. And uh, they were, um, they made sure to let the reader know that this is strictly an, an interpretation and there's no, um, the any translation in English is already going to leave out um, an even greater uh, meaning or full story than in the uh, Sanskrit versions, because um, our our language is a lot more limited. Um, so that's an interesting thing. But to it say. looks that's what he said in the in the um, preface, not the introduction. <clears throat> translated, yeah, translated preface. Uh, I guess to make sure to honor and respect um, just everyone who's come before him. Hmm. Yeah, I still have to uh, finish the introduction. It makes it seem a little bit, it makes it seem like the real thing is inaccessible to some extent. Um, here, let me, let me show you. Uh, I think it was towards the end. Um, let's 
So extremely literal translations of the Gita already exist. We've aimed rather an interpretation. Here is one of the greatest religious documents of the world. Let us not approach it too pedantically as an archaic text, which must be jealously guarded by university professors. You know, like see where it's going there. Yeah, uh, I mean. It has something to say urgently to every one of us. We have to extract that message from the terseness of the original Sanskrit. And here the great classical commentators can help us. In making this translation, three of them have been consulted, Shankara, Shridhara Swami, and Madhasadana Saraswati. So, so it sounds like from that, um, the angle of vision that the, auth that the commentator has there is Advaita, is the non-dual, which is um, a bit atheistic conclusion that um, there is no difference between the God and the different personalities, uh, that mm -hmm. all separation is just an illusion. Uh, and actually, there is only one Brahman, and, and the goal of life is to realize that your individuality is just an illusion and that you're really God. That's what the Advaita Vedanta says. And yeah. uh, so that's Shankaracharya, and you mentioned that he mentioned Shankaracharya's names. So, okay. So it, it's good to at least keep in mind that whatever they say there will be will be from the perspective of that philosophy of Advaita Vedanta. And that might not necessarily have the same conclusions or insight as other perspectives. Well, it the, it's confusing because in the introduction, I see what, you, what you're saying there, because the, was that, um, who was it? Shankara was the yeah. atheistic? Yeah. Okay. And um, in but then in the introduction, they're uh, talking about the perennial philosophy. Where'd it go? In the divine ground called mind or pure of light, or the pure light of the void, the place of the high gods. Yes. <laughs> The place of pure, so the, the conclusion of the Shankaracharya is that, um, that that ultimate reality is pure light, and that the goal is to merge into that pure light. That pure light is called Brahman, and that all differentiation is an illusion, and that the goal of life is to get rid of your conception of individuality and merge into that light. So it's like voidism, like all experience. That's atheist. You would say that's atheistic because. What it does is it completely uh, does not recognize the aspect of God that is personal, named Bhagavan. There are three aspects of God discussed in Vedic literature. One is Brahman, which is that bright light, effulgence. That is an actual aspect of God, but it doesn't end there. And there is Paramatma, which is the aspect of God, which is in the heart of all living beings, known kind of like as the higher self, which is always there with the living entities in their various lives, trying to help them in a theistic direction, but also respecting their own personal desire. That's Paramatma also uh, can be known as the Holy Spirit in the Christian tradition. And, uh, and then Bhagavan. Bhagavan is the personality of God. And that is the aspect of God that is full of uh, transcendental experience and for, for himself. That's what we were saying with these Western philosophers, that mm -hmm. the absolute is not, you know, is not just a substance. It's not a substance of light that you have to merge into. Not only substance, it's subject. It's personal, personality. It's the and how, and out there it's not right. creating us or something. It's not so yeah, abstract it's like more, that. It's, yeah. It's, because that's how, exactly how, we, how you just described it, is how, you know, that will be the concept that people have, that it's kind of very abstract, God is kind of out there, this energy, 
and that we don't really, you know, how can you relate to that actually? It's like, it's your personality, yeah. Yeah. And, and so that's one of the reasons why it's, it's you know, a relationship, a real relationship, yeah. right? Because we can know from our direct experience already that even in mundane relationships with other people, when it's a very nice relationship, you know, then that is the fulfillment. We, we can experience fulfillment to some degree. But whenever it's a mundane relationship, it won't ever be eternal fulfillment because we're looking for it with the wrong kind of life that eternal fulfillment is in loving relation of service of God with the personality of God, Bhagavan. Mm -hmm. And actually then from that higher perspective, we, we actually learn what that light, that effulgence called Brahman, what it actually is. It's the effulgence of that personality. The effulgence, like sometimes you see the depictions of, you know, various saints having like some kind of light emanating from their head. If you see, like sometimes you mm -hmm. see of Christ and all that. So that kind of effulgence, Brahman, that light that uh, Shankaracharya and his followers are trying to merge into, which is a real experience, by the way, that is something that can, that is a, that is a goal that some people have, but the nature of the living entity is to always be active. So that activity of trying to merge into a void and just be still in that bliss is not an eternal destination because of the constant moving of the soul. It will, it, will, it will leave that destination because it's always trying to attach itself to some kind of fulfillment. It's, yeah. it's, it's being attracted to that merging into the light of God because, you know, right now that's the self-centered fulfillment. And then eventually we'll have another different fulfillment because it's all self-centered. But when, when we can uh, learn and accept about the personality of God and, and then direct all of our desires and fulfillment to satisfying the fulfillment of the personality of God in the proper process, of course, we have to learn about what that process actually entails, then that is a lasting fulfillment because we're using all of that dynamic, all that active energy that we have, we're using it to its fullest potential in uh, that dynamic service of God. So it's, that, that's the goal that I've learned at least uh, how, to, how to view that. And it seems, it seems very well, nice. The goal is it not, I mean, I wonder, I've always wondered um, from like, I just know bits and pieces of, of uh, Vedic religion or Hin Hinduism. And that's, that's what this is, right? There's some difference actually, but it's, it's okay to talk about it like that for now. I'd also like to know the diff, I, I need to figure out the differences because uh, I don't, I only know bits and pieces, like I said, and, um, but I was raised Catholic and um, uh, with a, like a Brazilian twist, because there is, I think, culture um, and ethnicity and how a religion is expressed by a certain culture definitely changes your per perception or experience, religious experience. So, I've always wondered, um, oh my gosh, I lost it. I talked too much. <laughs> I talked too much. Uh, what was I going to ask? You were talking about the absolute, the light, the void, the selfish, the selfish act, desire. Yeah, so that kind of desiring to merge into the void for eternal peace is motivated purely. You got it? Yes, I got it. Okay, so the goal, the goal of um, that relationship with God, is it not, um, there's a correlation of, uh, uh, with the revelations in the Bible, right? I, I feel like there's this, there is this correlation between I can see it between that, the Vedic knowledge or wisdom with that part of the Bible where it's, it, it's really trying to address or convey the, the relationship is, it's not like a definite, it's not like a judgment day per, per se that 
we should prepare for or expect, but it's more of a personal, it's like you have to die to live. That that uh, slide, I, I correlate that with the revelations in my mind. And yeah, that whole ideology or, you know, how Christians, there are a lot of Christians that... Yeah. Um, will condemn people <laughs> for judgment day to come, but it's really, it's a lot more, a lot more than that. And Lord Jesus Christ came to teach people love of God without a doubt. The teachings of Christ, right, especially the Ten Commandments, I believe the first commandment is love God above all else and then love your neighbor as yourself, right? But the very first mm -hmm. instruction is to love God above all else. Like yeah. That's the first thing, I, right? The first, the very first thing he says. And then everything else after that is, is more uh, how to regulate your lifestyle, but it's all supposed to be regulating based on that first thing, love God above all else. What does that mean to love God? That's a relationship, especially when he's talking about the father. The father is not a shining light. Right. The father is a personal relationship. He's talking about a very specific kind of personal relationship there. Right. He says the father. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, so of course, in Christianity, Jesus is the son, the father. He's there to teach love of the father. And then the Holy Spirit is there. Um, so the Holy Spirit is how, how they come to love of God, that aspect of God that's inside them that brings them to love of God. That's the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And, and then Jesus, especially from the Vedic perspective, is, is seen as an avatar of God. Not that Jesus is uh, God in his full potency, but that he is a, he's a, an individual soul, Jesus Christ, and he's an empowered incarnation of the Lord. So he's an incarnation that has come to teach the public based on time, place, and circumstance, whatever the current circumstance of the people were, whatever their current level of reasoning was, etc. He's come to teach them how to come closer to God. Yeah. And it's a personal relationship. It's a personal relationship. That's one of the main, main things. But that gets, it definitely gets lost in the translation, right? So no, that's not, trans not translation, but in the degree of realization, because one of the biggest things of Veda is the maintenance of this disciplic succession is learning from a genuinely realized guru who has also learned from a genuinely realized guru who has, right, again, genuinely learned this is this, this realization, realization, right? But, but not, it's just realization on the individual level. It's learning from someone. It's learning from a living individual who has already learned from a living individual, who has already learned from a living individual, et cetera. It's, it's this living process of realization. And to some extent, that got lost in Christianity. I mean, the Pope is supposed to represent that disciplic succession, you know, mm. but uh, to some extent, like after the apostles and, you know, whoever their direct followers were, to some extent, you know, we might be able to say that the, uh, the pure disciplic succession of the genuine realization of how to cultivate love for God perhaps got a little muddled or confused Hmm. Uh, with with ma many practicing Christians, but that's not to say that there aren't some who were definitely able to develop love for God. Like just recently, I heard so many times uh, of, of this Saint uh, Francis of Assisi, who is literally like a very realized soul and who really had love for God and had a high degree of realization and was a practicing Christian. So ultimately, like we can never forget that the will of God is always there. God is personal, but also in a way that is beyond our conception because um, God is absolute. His will is always there and is never uh, neglecting us. So if we can always remember that and remember that whatever we're experiencing is not outside of the will of God and, and that we try to open ourselves more to that place in our heart where we can be receptive and desire to learn what that will is and and how to serve that will and and hopefully that will bring us to not just relying on our own mind because some people will think 
okay, I have to figure it out in my head. No, that's really not the process because you end up just imagining things. That's why this this yeah. ro this role of the of a self realized soul guru is so important because you know how how can you know that you're not just imagining things is when you're hearing from someone who is qualified and realized outside of yourself and then surrendering to that and it's in a very sweet way and in a very uh it's very nice it's not like a dangerous kind of thing many people kind of put defense up uh about the idea of surrender and because of the, you know so many people have been misled but maybe you know their own sincerity, you know, led them down that path or lack of sincerity. For someone who is genuinely sincere in their heart, that they want to learn how to develop love for God. The process is there and God is there. His will is there. His grace is there. And that will help guide us in a proper direction. It's not just based on, you know, like luck or our own, our own ability to rationally find the path. Like the grace of God is there and is very active in that process. Yeah. Yeah, I, I see it. I see it. All right. Um, so this is the link. Yeah, the Bhagavad Gita is there. Should we wrap up or do you have anything else? Yeah. Um, I don't think I have anything else right now. Right. Thank you. Of course. Take care, Amanda. We'll see you soon. All right. See you Namaste. soon.